We are recording. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I bid you welcome to Port Wallace United Church in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. Bienvenue, les gens, tous les gens qui nous joignent de toutes les parties du monde, en français, à Dartmouth, en Nouvelle-Écosse. Welcome to all the people from Deutschland, from, from the Netherlands, and from the South Africa today. And on the Gaelic, because you have heard of the Gaelic, and you have heard of the Gaelic. As we join together, we join with people from all around the world, all of God's children from whichever language, whichever culture we come. We come together to praise God this morning. So I'd ask you to join me now in our call to worship, as published for us in our bulletins. People of God, the hour has come. We are ready to be transfigured. God wants us to become more than we ever imagined possible. We are, we are ready, ready to be transfigured. Are we ready to go beyond the limits of what the world says is achievable? We are ready to be transfigured. Then let us go to God. Our hymn is Immortal and Visible, God Only Wise. in the prayer of approach. God of the universe, who shines with light unimagined and unimaginable, come and transform us with the light of your presence. Light the lamp of learning in our midst. Tend the wicks of the wise with your wisdom. Kindle the coals of knowledge that keep us in your care. And breathe on us until we shine with the light of salvation. Revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated for the lesson. Our First Testament lesson is from 2 Kings, chapter 2. Now the Lord was going to take Elijah up to heaven in a windstorm, and Elijah and Elisha were leaving Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, because the Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as you live, I won't leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The group of prophets from Bethel came out to Elisha. These prophets said to Elisha, do you know that the Lord is going to take your master away from you today? Elisha said, yes, I know. Don't talk about it. Elijah said, Elisha, stay here because the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as you live, I won't leave you. 
so they went to Jericho. The group of prophets from Jericho approached Elijah, Elisha and said to him, do you know that the Lord is going to take your master away from you today? He said, yes, I know, don't talk about it. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here because the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as you live, I won't leave you. So both of them went on together. 50 members from the group of prophets also went along, but they stood at a distance. Both Elijah and Elisha stood beside the Jordan River. Elijah then took his coat, rolled it up, and hit the water. Then the water was divided in two. Both of them crossed over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, what do you want me to do for you before I'm taken away from you? Elisha said, let me have twice your spirit. Elijah said, you've made a difficult request. If you can see me when I'm taken from you, then it will be yours. If you don't see me, it won't happen. They were walking along, talking, when suddenly a fiery chariot and fiery horses appeared and separated the two of them. Then Elijah went to heaven in a windstorm. Elisha was watching, and he cried out, O oh, my father, my father, Israel's chariots and its riders. When he could no longer see him, Elisha took hold of his clothes and ripped them in two. Here ends the reading. Let us sing together an old spiritual, Swing Low, Sweet Chariot. gospel lesson comes to us from Mark chapter 9. Six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and brought them to the top of a very high mountain where they were alone. He was transformed in front of them, and his clothes were amazingly bright, brighter than if they had bleached, been bleached white. Elijah and Moses appeared and were talking with Jesus. Peter reacted to all of this by saying to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good that we're here. Let's make three shrines, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He said this because he didn't know how to respond, for the three of them were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice, voice spoke from the cloud, This is my son, whom I dearly love. Listen to him. Suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them not to tell anyone what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. 
have a little bit here that goes out to the younger generation. And I'd like to ask a question. Who are you? You might answer, I'm the one who likes trains, or I'm the one who sings really well, or I am the child of my parents. But I'm not asking what you like, or what you do, or where you come from. At some point, we all have to face the question, who am I? And sometimes the answer might not be what we expect. For most of my life, something I might have answered was, I am a boy. But then I, one day I realized, I was much more than that. I was something more than just a boy, but I wasn't a man. I was something new and beautiful and different. It was more important to me to be an artist, a singer, a musician. And then one day I realized I was more than just a musician. I was supposed to be a minister. I think God wanted me to be a minister my whole life, but God was waiting patiently until I figured it out. That's kind of like what happens to Jesus in this Bible story. He realizes he's not just a carpenter. He realizes he's not just Mary and Joseph's son. He realizes he's not just another person. He finally realizes he's the son of God, and he realizes exactly what that means. And someday, you might have a realization about who you are and what you mean to God. You might realize you have a ministry too. You might realize a lot of things about yourself, and that's perfectly fine. That's what growing up is all about. Throughout our lives, we learn to have a relationship with God and work with God's plan, no matter who we are or what we do or where we come from. Just like Jesus and the disciples learned about his relationship with God on the mountain. Will you join me in the teaching prayer? In peace, peace dear, dear God, God I, I come, come to you, you through Jesus Christ, Christ who makes me new. And, and while I run or play or rest, be with those whom I love best. Guide me in your holy way as you walk with me each day. Amen. Our hymn is number 575 in Voices United. I'm going to live so God can use me. Please stand and of my mouth and the meditations in all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I take for the text today to jump off into a sermon the words from the Gospel. There he was transfigured before them. Now the original Greek text for this morning uses the Greek word metamorphose. Jesus was metamorphosized before them. The dictionary describes metamorphosis as a biological process by which an animal physically develops after birth or hatching, involving a conspicuous and relatively abrupt change in the animal's body structure through cell growth and differentiation. Well, ain't that fantastic? 
let's boil that down to something real. We're more familiar with the process of metamorphosis if we talk about a caterpillar becoming a butterfly. When the caterpillar has reached a certain stage of development, it goes into the cocoon stage and begins a period of metamorphosis, eventually emerging as a butterfly. It's the same genetic material that goes into a cocoon as comes out of the cocoon, but it's completely transformed in that situation, transfigured, it's completely differentiated, and we see it in a very different light. This is metamorphosis. The Greek word meta means after, morphosis, form. After changing form, we see things in a different light. The gospel writers use this biological process to describe how their relationship with Jesus changed on Mount Tabor, the lesson of which we read this morning. Six days, symbolizing the caterpillar stage or symbolizing the days of his earthly work, for six means a time of work, Jesus goes to the top of Mount Tabor, a very peculiar and particular mountain in the north of Israel in the Galilee region. He's wrapped up there in the friendship of three of his closest friends. Remember, the three means one cycle complete, so now another cycle can begin. So he takes to the mountaintop Peter, James, and John. And there on the top of Mount Tabor, from which you can survey a good portion of the Galilee. You can look over towards Syria, you can look north to the mountains of Lebanon, you can look over towards the Mediterranean Sea, and you can see down towards the plains that are very fertile in that area of Israel. From there, you can see a good portion of the Jewish world. And in that presence, and at that time, Jesus is transfigured. The relationship Jesus had with his disciples goes through a metamorphosis. They see him in a way in which they had never perceived him before. They see him in a new light. They see him in the light of Moses, the great lawgiver, and Elijah, the great prophet preacher. And suddenly they see the larger picture. They see the terrain laid out before them. They see the greater scope of things. And they see how Jesus is bringing all of this together. They suddenly see more than the man they knew, this rabbinical preacher. They see him in conversation with the law, the Torah, that great constitution of the Jewish people that demands things happen, that gives you a way of living life. And they know that he has not come to destroy any of that, not to destroy the law, nor to remove a single letter, nor a single dot, but to see it in a new perspective, to give us a larger scope. And sometimes when we follow the letter of the law, we miss the spirit of the law. And it seems like Jesus is bringing the spirit back into the law of the Torah. They see him in conversation with Elijah, who is one of the great preachers and prophets of the Old Testament, who, like Moses, had a rendezvous with God and was carried away on a chariot. And as the story of Moses ends with the words, and no one knows the place of his sepulcher to this day, so no one knows where Elijah is to this very day. But there was a belief that that spirit, that breath from God, would always be present among the people. And still is the belief today that the spirit of God, the breath of God, is still breathing life into the worship services offered by people around the world. Peter, James, and John, three very, very unlikely people, three very rough people, three very unexpecting people, three very common people, see Jesus transfigured before them. He is the same genetic material that came up the mountain, but now they see him in a different light. The voice that they had heard rumors of had spoken at his baptism, is now speaking to them in this very point in time and saying to them, this is my beloved son, my incarnation, my outpouring of my very self. This is the one who brings it all together. Listen to him. The disciples are so caught up in this new experience of God and understanding of God and what they're seeing, the visions of a larger picture, that they are transfigured. Not only is Jesus transfigured, but they are transfigured. And they go through a metamorphosis, a change of thought, a change of mind, a change of expression. Their existence has changed. Their perception of Judaism has changed. The perception of all the land has changed. Their entire concept of Jesus is changed. No longer is he just a great teacher. No longer is he a drinking buddy. No longer is he a good guy to hang out with. All of a sudden he becomes a proto-socialist, an interesting revolutionary. And they see him in the larger light of Jewish history. They see him in the unfolding drama of God's presence in the world. They see him emerging as something new. And they see him uniting and embodying all the teachings of the law and of the prophets, bringing it all together to suddenly make sense. And they probably thought to themselves, 
oh my God, what have we gotten ourselves into? Because that's what we think when we're transformed. Oh my God, what have we gotten ourselves into? It's like the song from Les Miserables. Do you hear the people sing, singing the songs of angry men? Because you might have never heard it before, but now you're hearing it. Do you hear the people sing, singing the songs of angry men? It is the music of a people who will not be slaves again. When the beating of your heart echoes the beating of the drums, there is a life about to start when tomorrow comes. Will you join in our crusade? Who will be strong and stand with me? Beyond the barricade, is there a world you long to see? Then join the fight that will give you the right to be free. This is the spirit that rose within the disciples. Beyond the barricade, beyond the barricades of tradition, of sexism, of economics, of politics, of power, there is a vision of a world you long to see. Then join in the fight. These disciples were transfigured. Peter screams, Rabbi, let us build three shine, shrines. And Jesus replied, Peter, it's not about building shrines or monuments to God. It's about being caught up in the movement, caught up in the revolution, caught up in the evolution of religion from static tradition into something that transforms and transfigures the world, where men and women live and love and laugh and are set free. It's about lifting up the fallen. It's about healing the brokenhearted. It's about feeding the hungry. It's about restoring the exiled. It's about saying to those in authority, now is the time for social change. Not tomorrow. Not when we have enough money. Not when we have enough vaccines. Not when we have enough things to make the economy more stable. Now is the time for social change. Now is the time for guaranteed income. Now is the time to move away from welfare and unemployment and programs that diminish and stigmatize people. Now is the time to give people human dignity. Give all people human dignity. Those three men came down that mountain that day transfigured. And at the end of the gospel lesson for today, Jesus has to rein them in. They have been so radically changed that they can't not but want to tell this to the world. And he gives them a very peculiar thing. He doesn't just suggest to them, he orders them not to tell anyone what they had seen until after the resurrection. Those three men were themselves transfigured in heart, in mind, in body, and in soul. It became very clear to them what Jesus was about and how God was with him and how God was speaking through them and how God was bringing them together with God in this enterprise of redemption how the forces of good and righteousness and justice were with him, and nothing could hold these forces back. It was hard to constrain their evangelical push toward a better world that they had envisioned and caught the vision of. Like Moses, they had seen the promised land. Like Elijah, they were caught up in the spirit of God and were being carried off into new heights. And like Jesus, they were and are the catalyst for the advent of a brave new world. This is the mission of the church, to inspire people with a vision of a world that is different and that can be different from the prevailing forces that imprison us, to give us a vision of a larger plan rather than a nationalistic or populist vision laced with xenophobia and racism, and to empower us, the people, to be transformed with a vision that we can see ourselves transformed and are not locked in a caste system where the, to quote Martin Luther King, slightly modified, where the sons and daughters of former slaves can become a prime minister, where the sons of fishermen can become a minister, where the daughters of seamstress can become the moderator of the church. The church calls us to be transformed and to be transformers of the world until everything shines with a new light. But I think also in this present time, God is calling the church itself to be transformed. This COVID-19 may be a call from God that we have to transform and transfigure ourselves as an institution. This is an opportunity to let go of structures and traditions and chains and discover what it means to be the living body of Christ in a new world. Maybe the Spirit is trying to breathe new life into us at this very moment. Koine Greek was the language of the day the economic language, the lingua franca of the day when Jesus and the disciples were doing their ministry. It was not the traditional language of the synagogue, biblical Hebrew. It was not the Polish Latin of the ruling classes. It was not the language in which Jesus was raised, Aramaic. But it was the everyday language of the population that the world was using at that time to talk with each other. And therefore, Koine Greek became the language that Jesus used 
or was used in the Gospels to spread the good news of the Gospel. So now is the time maybe to discover a new way of using language in the church. Maybe we have to move away from the formalized worship of a bulletin and in a building into Snapchat, into TikTok, and whatever the new electronic medium is far beyond me. It is the time for us to spread the gospel in new and innovative ways through electronics, through spoken media, through recorded media. Maybe it's time to let go of the ways we knew and to be born again, to go through metamorphosis into something new. Maybe the Spirit is giving us new birth in this cocoon of COVID-19. Maybe we have the opportunity to help people see Jesus in a new light. I think that's very important, for I, for one, am sick and tired of hearing and seeing the media speak of fundamentalist, literalist wingnuts as if they were the entire Church of Christ. People who often ter would turn me off from following Christ. I hear the media talk of three churches in the lower mainland of BC who refuse to follow the rules. Three churches, it hits the news. Well, what about the 19,000 churches that are following the rules? You see, there's more than what is presented, and it's time for us to present a new vision of who we are. It's time for us to move away from people saying, oh, we cannot do that because we've always thought that for the last thousand years and it became dogma. I don't care about dogma. I want to live with the living Christ and the spirit of Christ. Maybe it's time to reach out to people around us and say who we are, an open, progressive group of Christians who have found life with each other and with Christ in our midst. I believe the spirit has brought us to this place and this time so that we can meet Christ again and see Christ in a new light so that we can be transfigured, have our minds, have our body, have our language, have everything changed that we can glorify God, so that we can transform the world in which we live, can transform the minds of people around us, can transform the social economic situations of people around us, that we can see Christ in people and people can see Christ in their midst and be transformed by that and transform the media so that we can present Christ in new ways. I believe that the Spirit is calling the church into a metamorphosis we will be totally rearranged. Maybe some of us will be totally deranged as well by the time we get this figured out. But we will emerge as something beautiful for God when we get through this metamorphosis. So who would think that one short year ago, in two weeks' time, our world had changed so much? We've already gone through so much, and we've already started to emerge in new and wonderful ways. I don't know what the future holds, but I know God is with us. And I am willing to climb every mountain to see the world in a new light. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, among the many words that we have heard, may one word come to rest and nestle within us. And may we be born to a new and a living hope with Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Will you stand and join me in the statement of faith? We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God, who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit, we trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now comes time for us to make our offerings. So let us hear the choir as they present their offering this morning.
As a community of faith, let us present our offerings to God. Let us pray the prayer for all of our offerings before God this morning. Receive the offerings of our voices and our lives, employ both for your glory and the good of your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In our prayers this morning, let us remember the people around the world who are calling out to God in a variety of new and different ways. Let us remember our families and friends, wherever they may be scattered in this world, and let us bring them to God this morning. Let us remember our children and grandchildren. Let us remember our parents and our grandparents. Let us remember those who have come to inhabit our minds. Maybe God is planting them there this morning. We remember those who have gone before us and who are at rest in Christ's kingdom. And remember those whom Christ is giving into our midst that we should be their shepherds and their caregivers. We remember this morning all who love on the St. Valentine's Day, all who have the courage to love, and all who maybe find love difficult but are brave enough to give themselves to love. To love another person is to see the face of God, said one of the great poets. And God is love, says John. And anyone who does not love has not known God. Therefore, let us give thanks to God for people we've loved, for people who have loved us, and for the love which unmerited we have experienced. Let us pray. All praise and thanksgiving be unto you, almighty God, for this world that you have created, that you have formed out of love, that you have decorated with beauty, and which dances in joy before you. We thank you for the splendor of creation, for the imagination you have put into creation, for the joy that springs out of creation, and for the surprises that have come to us and which still await us. We give you thanks. We give you thanks for the blessings of family, not only the family into which we have been born, but the family of choice and the family of association and for the family of faith. These families which have nurtured us and cared us and loved us in a variety of new and exciting ways. For them, we give you thanks this day and ask your blessing upon all of our families that they should be peace and live in peace. We thank you for the delight we find in doing the work you have set before us, for the laughter, 
for the friendships, for the kindnesses, which have surrounded us and which have come to us and dwell within us. We give you thanks that you have helped others bring us comfort, and through us maybe you have brought comfort to another. We give you thanks. We thank you for the delight we find in finishing tasks, in seeing a job well done, and knowing that at the end of the day we have created something with you that can be beautiful and kind and used for the good and glory of others. Above all, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who has come into our midst to transfigure us in new and exciting ways and to bring us new possibilities of how we may serve you and reach out to you. We give you thanks. For the words of the law, the Torah, for the words of the preachers, for the music that has come to us from the Psalms and other ways, for the great leaders of your church who have brought us into harmony with you, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for cultures that have brought new light to us, especially in Black History Month, we give you thanks for the African Canadians who have brought light to us and music to us in new and exciting ways. Help us all to experience and honor the glory of music that comes, of delight that comes, of insight that comes from many cultures. Through them you speak to us in new and exciting ways. God of the heavens, of those things which are not seen, and God of the earth, those things that are seen, we give you thanks. Though we may forget many in our prayers, we know that you forget none. Therefore, hold in your care this day all those who labor and work on behalf of others. Teachers, professors, doctors, nurses, truck drivers, janitors, fishermen, farmers, police officers, firefighters, hold them all in your care this day. Hold into the care of the ones that nurture us, a variety of different people, Hold into care those who challenge us and bless them in their challenge. Hold in your care this day those whom we wish to be held in your care. And above all, hold us also in your care. Wipe from our foreheads the furrows of care. Smooth from our soul the lines of worry and doubt. And grant us the peace we need to rest in you, to relax in you, and to be one with you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray before you, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy reich come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Donne nous aujourd'hui notre pain de jour, et pardonne nos offenses, nous pardonnons aussi ceux qui nous ont offensés. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if lats and riacht, augs a kumach, augs a glor, Amen. Our hymn is taken from Voices United number 296. This is God's Wondrous World, 296.
you join me in the parting prayer? Bless to us, O oh God, this day, the doors we open, the thresholds we cross, and all the roads that lie before us. Go with us always as we go, and at the close of our day, welcome us home. Some interpreters say that the salt of the earth is actually a catalytic agent in an earth oven. We are the fire starters of the world, in addition to being the light of the world. So go, let's start the fire that powers the engine of God's kingdom. Remembering this, the light of God is not in candles nor institutions, but in us. We are the fire starters, we are the light. So ex I invite you to take your candles and extinguish them. And now will you join me in the benediction. May the blessing of the maker be yours. And circling us, above us, and within us. May the blessing of the sun be yours. The wine and the water, the bread and the stories, to feed us and remind us. May the blessing of the spirit be yours. The wind and the fire, the still small voice of calm, to comfort us and disturb us. And may the blessings of God, three in one and one in three, be yours this day and every day. To protect, to protect us, us, defend us, and encourage us, and strengthen us. And may we bless each other. A blessing rooted in our common pilgrimage, the blessing of a friend. Take time to exchange that blessing of friendship with those around you. Take time to exchange that blessing of friendship with those who are in your mind. Look at the pictures that may be around your room. Give thanks for those people and say, peace be with you this day. The peace of Christ be with us all. You join me in the choral prayer. formally ends our worship today, but our worship continues in many different ways around this world in everything we do, in everything we say, in everything we do, we think. Have a good week. May God be with you on this journey. In Christ our Lord, God bless. Bye-bye. Although the recording might have ended now, now comes the time for chat. If anybody would like to join us for a few moments of chat, now is your time. Cheryl is in the office and she will make known your request and we will try to respond as best we can. Let's go through the announcements first, Ivan. I can't hear you, Cheryl. Can we do the announcements first? Yes, the announcements. We should be doing the announcements. Good point. <laughs> <laughs> the announcements are before you, hopefully on your screen. Or they will pop up quickly. This is the week of February the 14th, so happy Valentine's Day today. I know everybody's got things lined up for everybody. <clears throat> Afterwards, there'll be a few moments of Zoom fellowship if you'd like to join us. The link will be posted in the chat today. Show of Tuesday comes from, um, to be shriven, to move the fat from your house. Mardi Gras in French, Tuesday of the fat, to get rid of the fat in your house, and various other names. It's the last day of Carnival in the calendar before Lent begins on Wednesday. So there's a discussion group that day via Zoom if you'd like to join in. I know Blake would be more than pleased to have your presence. Ash Wednesday, 10 o'clock in the morning devotions on our Facebook page. Paul will be here at noon to pick up food for the food bank. You see the deal of the week there, two kilograms of sugar for a dollar, two boxes of Max and cheese for a dollar. Great deal for everybody. Thursday morning, the coffee break. Give a chance if you want to join us. Thursday evening, the choir practice. Does Adam have anything you want to say about choir practice? Come to choir practice. Come to choir practice, okay. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Uh, actually, not this Thursday. Don't come this Thursday. Come next Thursday. <laughs> okay. Actually, don't come this Thursday. Come next Thursday. Okay. Next Sunday, we begin Lent. 
Lent is a time of reflection and drawing into personal and deeper relationship with Jesus. So we want us to think about what Lent means for each of us as we grow into a deeper and new understanding. Next Sunday also, the session will meet at noon, and in the evening, the stewards will meet. Tamson, I'm going to call upon you to speak for a moment about a project you're going to be doing on the beginning of Lent. Yes. Um, so as part of my placement here at Port Wallace, I will be doing a Lenten educational series. Uh, this is particularly as part of Port Wallace's journey toward becoming an officially affirming church. We're going to be learning about what we are actually affirming and what it means to be affirming. Uh, so really peeling back the theological debates and looking at the real issues facing the LGBTQ community, its culture, its history, and its relationship with the church. Uh, so I'm very, very excited to be presenting this. We start Monday, February 22nd. Um, you can contact the church or go to the Port Wallace website for the link. Uh, it will be conducted on Zoom. Uh, so the more the merrier, all are welcome. Please come, ask me questions. Um, I'm, I'm very excited for this. Thank you. So let's make that learning project something wonderful, exciting, and really different for all of us as we assist Tamson in her learning goals. You'll see there the prayer circle for the church. Please remember those people in your prayers. We don't need last names. God knows who we're talking about. Sympathy of the congregation is also extended to Carol Bean on the death of Donnie, who will be having his funeral this coming Wednesday. So please keep them in your prayers as well. Expansion of the news, Virgil Church, you'll see it there, faith, faith cloth, face, masks. It's like me trying to say Irish wrist watch. I can't say those words quickly together. You see how offerings can be made. So once again, thank you for your offerings and for caring for your church in so many different ways. Ukulele Church, some people have already tried this out and find it really exciting to be with Linnea in this new and exciting way. Give it a hook if you've got somebody that would like to join you. Great for kids, I really got to say. It's a great outreach. Also, there's containers of um, maple syrup available through the church if you'd like to join us for those ones as well. Also, we're looking at having a confirmation class in a new and exciting way, and we're trying to figure out how to do that. So if you think you'd be interested in confirming your faith and saying, I want to be a follower of Jesus, contact the church office, and we're going to arrange some sort of a class, probably a Zoom set, um, webinar of some sort, or a Zoom meeting, where we can talk with each other and grow in faith. You can be of any age. We'd ask the minimum wage to be, or age to be about um, 12, 13. But you might want to be 80 years old and join the church. It's a great opportunity to explore faith. So keep that. Call the church this week and say, I'm interested. I'll see what I can do. And we'll go from there. Are there any further announcements for the community as we're gathering? I'm not hearing any. So those are your announcements for the church community. Now we will move into chat. And Sam's going to turn up the microphone in his